So thank you, everyone. Uh, I have the pleasure of following AI with Mission to Decommission, a 25-year-old system. So we're going to rock this. Uh, so good morning. Um, I am so excited to be here at ProductCon in New York. Uh, this is my first time, and I know there are a bunch of you that I met earlier that also have shared that this is their first time. Um, so before joining Amex, I actually did management consulting for about seven years and really got tired living out of the suitcase and decided in 2010 to join Amex. And since joining Amex, I've had the pleasure to work on so many great products. One of them is Amex Offers, which connects our merchants and our customers with most relevant and personalized offers. Um, currently, I head up the Enterprise Data Platforms team, which constitutes of three big things. One is managing the product development for all of our big data ecosystem. Uh, second is managing the enterprise data management uh, tooling, such as data quality. And then, then third is creating some of the best be uh, BI products for our 15,000 colleagues that use data to drive insight and provide the best customer experiences. And if I wasn't enjoying my product job so much at Amex, uh, I would love to spend more time painting, doing hot yoga, and traveling. All right. So let's get energy going in this room. I'm going to start with a quick poll on some questions around product lifecycle. Uh, I want everybody to participate, OK? It's a mandatory thing. How many of you here would be really excited to work on a brand new product? Show of hands. Great. Um, how many of you would be excited to take that product and actually mature it and grow it? Yeah, great number. All right. How many of you now would be excited if your manager or boss came and told you, hey, I'm going to give you a task to decommission a 20-plus-year-old system? <laughs> All right, I got like four hands and a woohoos. Uh, fantastic. And now, how many of you actually have decommissioned something and worked for a company that not only sponsored it, championed it, but celebrate, celebrated the decommissioning of the ecosystem. All right, good amount, uh, more than I expected. Uh, so that is the topic du jour for us. Uh, so over the next few minutes, I'll actually cover uh, how Amex made a bold decision to decommission one of its legacy platforms that was very heavily used and embedded in all of the processes across the board. I'll take you through how we went about it, what it took, how we mo mobilized it, and then maybe uh, share some of the lessons learned that can be applied for future um, similar efforts. All right, so before I jump into uh, how we decommissioned, uh, let's talk a little bit about and give you context of what we decommissioned and why. Uh, so let me paint this picture and bring it to life. So the system that we decommissioned was called Information uh, Delivery Network, IDN for short. It was created about 25 plus years ago at this point in time. And when we actually looked into it, we thought, OK, it's one platform, but it's actually not one. It's five different platforms, but it's extremely heavily used across all of the different parts of Amex, all the way from acquisition to how we marketed, how we did regulatory reporting. Uh, and to name just few. And for some of you, you're like, OK, 25 years ago, not that far. But actually, just think about what was happening at that time. For some of us, we were moving away from dial-up. So you know, stop yelling at your mom for picking up the phone. <laughs> we're moving to broadband. MP MP3 players were just coming into the market. And the first iPhone was still about eight years away in 2007. So a long time ago, right? And what had happened is, as we adopted um, IDN, it became really integral in how Amex evolved into a data-centric company. But as time evolved, our appetite to do more with data and our aspiration to tap into new advancements, uh, especially on the analytical side with AI and ML, in 2010, we decided we wanted to invest in yet another next generation big data ecosystem, which we created on-prem called Cornerstone. 
So when we created Cornerstone, it unlocked a lot of new ways for us doing business that we couldn't before in IBM. So the example that I gave you earlier of Amex offers, we actually powered a lot of the things that were running to power and bring to life Amex offers in Cornerstone. Uh, so that wouldn't have been possible in IDN. And so there was a lot of excitement across the company to start using Cornerstone. We saw a great number of new use cases as well as users moving into the new technology, embracing it at full speed and at full scale. But guess what happened? This is what happened, which is with soaring adoption of Cornerstone, our hypothesis was that, hey, IDN has been around for a while. Everybody's really excited with the new and shiny of Cornerstone. And people, as well as the business units, all of the users that we had, this you know 7,000 plus users, would just organically move into the new ecosystem and would be able to silently shut off IDN into the night. This was our expectation, right? You see the curve. This is what was going to happen. We told everybody in the company, go, just go, just move. Uh, but the reality was far from it. The reality was something like this, which is not only did people move and adopt into Cornerstone, which was great to see, and we unlocked a lot of new ways of solving problems, but the core problem was that nobody really wanted to move the existing workloads that were sitting in our old legacy system. So it kept running. Um, without documentation when start, people started leaving. So we had a lot of operational risk just letting it run. And people were content with that. Um, and that happened for about eight years, right? Every, every year we would go into planning. We would say, all right, this is the year. We're going to have people move. Uh, and every year it would compete against growth priorities. As I'm sure, as you guys know, growth revenue always takes over something called like migrations and decommission. No one wants to work on migration. If you ask a colleague, they'll be like, yeah, I want to work on that other new AI stuff over there, right? But this is really important. And so what we did was after eight years of the joke in the town being, yes, we're getting off of IDN, we said, nope, enough is enough. This is it. So in 2021, we decided that we were going to decommission for sure. And so we did a few main things that helped us. One, we made sure that the executive sponsorship was really there to make it real for this time. It was no longer a joke. The date was set. This message and the tone was set from the top to say, this is it. It's happening June 30th is the date. Ready or not, we're going to unplug. And thus, Project Unplug, uh, the code name for decommissioning IDN, uh, was born. And we made sure that we also had resources, right? We didn't want to compete with things uh, that were competing against growth priorities and things like that. So Amex as a company and the leadership team, we really invested in making sure that we not only had the right messaging, the right timelines, but the right level of uh, resourcing associated to what we needed to do uh, across the board. And so with that, Mission to Decommission was a go. All right, so what, what did additional things did we do to make sure that we were ready? So one of the big things was it was a federated data ecosystem, right? What that really means is across American Express, a lot of different business units and groups and colleagues were using this uh, ecosystem. And in order to move, it wasn't just a central team moving. We needed the entire village to be behind us and help us move into the new. So we really wanted to make sure that we pre-plan we brought everybody together. And when we started realizing how much was running, we still had about 60% of our colleagues that were running on both IDN and Cornerstone at the same time. It's a really, really painful process, right? When you have to go and check one table on one system, validate it with other, sure enough, they don't match. So colleagues were having a terrible experience as well. Um, so moving on. How did we go about doing it? So there were five main steps that we did. One was first we focused on creating a robust product. Given how widely IDN was used across the board, the first thing that we did was we wanted to make sure that we had clear operating model and roles and responsibilities defined uh, across the globe. Again, we had global usage. Every country that Amex operates in, we had somebody in that country actually using IDN for essential 
uh, things like sales incentive planning and things like that. So it was very, very embedded and very essential that we just couldn't unplug. So we had to do a lot of things to pull everybody together and make sure that we planned. The second thing that we did was we made sure that we had point of contact across each of the business units. Uh, and that was really essential because some of the business units were really big and we didn't want to get lost in not having clear accountability and responsibility across the board. So having key points of contact that were working against uh, our timelines as well as managing all of the inner workings of their own BUs was really, really critical. And then last thing that we did was we made sure that we created an overall plan with milestones because as you can imagine, IDN had become a spaghetti by the end of the time we started actually unraveling it. So there was a lot of data that one business unit would create that another business unit uh, needed for their processing. So there was a lot of dependencies that we needed to document, but more importantly, sort out to, cre to create like this entire plan that we could start executing on. Um, the second thing that we did was we established communication strategy. So again, given how big and how global uh, the usage of IDN was, it was really, really important that we employed diverse communication strategies. So I have some examples here, which are live examples from what we did. And, and one of them is email that we sent out almost weekly uh, towards the end of the thing. But the other one that has a big countdown of 86 is actually was on our jumbo trans in our offices. And every TV that you walk by, you couldn't get away from the fact that we were unplugging. We were real. This, is, this was going to happen. And so we used some of these techniques, but we also used a lot of different uh, mechanisms. So you got emails. You got one-on-one -on -one meetings. We presented at town halls. There was no stone that we left unturned to make sure that everybody knew, everybody understood the priority, and everybody was marching toward the same goal. So communication was so key in making sure that we were successful in getting to where we needed to go. The third thing uh, that we did was we made sure that we invested a lot in upskilling our colleagues, right? So Imagine, you know, 40% of our colleagues still had never used the new ecosystem. So they were still using their own legacy system. They were set in their ways. So we needed to make sure that not only did we communicate, but we gave them tools and trainings and made sure that they were able to understand the new ecosystem, how to log in, how to find your data, how do you derive insights. So it took a lot of planning and focus to make sure that we were making the right amount of progress in making sure that people knew how to effectively use the new ecosystem, but more importantly, that they were confident that what they were able to do and something that they had used for 20 years would still be seamless in the new ecosystem. So I would say not uh, making sure that you invest in colleagues and upskilling is, is another big thing that we focused on. Um, the fourth thing was have bias towards action, and we said that a lot, right? Uh, you can imagine how many curveballs came in, because again, the ecosystem was really, really archaic. We didn't have enough knowledge base. We didn't have colleagues around that actually worked on creating some of the processes around IDN, and they were long gone. So how do we go about it, right? So we worked together with lots of different teams, engineering team, reverse engineering, did everything that we could, but we knew we were going to have impediments along the way. And sure enough, we did. And so every time we ran into challenge, the team worked with all of our stakeholders and partners and basically said, all right, so this is the goal that we need. This is the key milestone that we need to meet. How do we do it? What do you need? Do you need more resourcing? Do you need an executive decision? Are we going to take an exception? How do we do it? And time boxing those decisions and having bias towards action. So swirling was not allowed on this project. You basically had to make a decision and move on. And then the last thing that we did was we celebrated, right? Think about new products that you create or you know, any new initiative that you're working on. Every MVP release, you would celebrate that, right? So why is decommissioning so different? So we made celebrating milestones a part of our journey. It was an 18-month-long journey, 
But throughout the journey, we made sure that we provided our partners and stakeholders with a forum and a platform to talk about how they actually went about it. Uh, we gave them a platform to come and present at town halls to say, hey, I've changed this and now I'm able to do this and this is how I've transformed it. So all of those celebrations and milestones, uh, victories were really, really important. So it wasn't waiting all the way till the end to you know, unplug and cork a champagne. It was like, let's continue to make sure that everybody uh, sees the value in what we're doing uh, as we went through the journey. And so after 18 months of making sure that we're maniacally focused on our target of decommissioning, not allowing anything to slip, what did we really gain? What did Amex really gain? So there were a lot of things that we gained, but I'll highlight three main things. The first one being cost saved. So it's not a big number, but we saved about $12 million annually just by not having one system run. Um, the second one is strengthened data management practices. So as you can imagine, think about your closet, right? Um, if you don't clean it out every spring, you will have a bunch of stuff that piles up. Nobody looks at it, and you will, by the end of 20 years, you will have a lot of things piled up. And that's exactly what had happened with IDN. We had date data tables that were, had no ownership, no management on it. So about 2,000 of those were existing. Again, creates operational risk for a company like Amex. Uh, so we really benefited from the fact that we cleaned the house. Uh, the second thing that we also benefited from was the fact that we have a lot of data at Amex. Uh, but we were able to reduce redundant data by about 15,000 variables. Again, doesn't sound like a lot, but for us it was a lot because it gave us consistency, it gave us quality, and it gave us the opportunity to have colleagues across the board from the federated teams work on one set of data versus having to go to multiple different sets and have different uh, numbers and different uh, derivations across the board. And then the last thing was we optimized a lot of the processing. Again, same thing. Things were running and nobody really looked at how do I optimize it? Can I do it differently? Because technology has changed, do I have an opportunity to rethink how I would solve the problem for the, for the business that might have taken 15 steps? I can do it in two steps, right? So a lot of transformations happen, but more importantly, um, in my example of decluttering your closet, when you start decluttering, you would get rid of stuff. So we got rid of 50% or more of processes that were unnecessarily running in our old legacy platform. So we really shed a lot of weight that was running across the board. Um, and so if I were to do this again uh, and you know, leave you with some of the lessons learned that hopefully you can apply to some of the decommissioning in the future, uh, the first one is senior leadership buy-in. Again, decommissioning, migrations, you can make them fun, like we did, uh, but usually are not considered fun, usually are not considered the project that gets the spotlight or gets celebrated regularly. Uh, so you have to make sure that you have the right level of support from top down, uh, because without that, you will compete with growth, you will compete with revenue, and migration just does not feel like it's the top priority for companies to invest in. But it is very, very important because, you know, what Jamie talked about AI, if you want to do things like AI, you want to make sure you have good data quality. How do you make sure you have da good data quality? You don't have data in 15 different places. You have it in singular places. You manage data quality. You manage the ecosystem there. Second is committed to timelines and date. It is very, very easy for everybody to say, yeah, you know what, June 30th, we're it's a long weekend, it's 4th of July. Like, let's just move it in like two, two more weeks and give colleagues time. And our answer was, no, we're prepared. We've spent 18 months. I said, I'm not taking vacation. We're doing this on June 30th, we're gonna do it. So again, just really committing to the date and consistently saying that across the board really helped us stay focused on what we were trying to do. The third one is making sure that we anticipate challenges. So challenges will continue to happen, uh, will, will come about, and Murphy's Law prevails. Let me just tell you that. And it will continue to prevail if you ever had the opportunity to work on a similar project. 
And the, the focus that needs to be there is how do I anticipate challenge proactively, but then how do I have framework and principles that help me attack those problems and address it and move on? And then the last one is communication. Communication, communication, communication. You do not want to like stay there on June 29th and somebody say, hey, I have a big process that I didn't realize it existed in, my, in the ecosystem and then you cannot decommission. So it's really important to make sure that you really dial up and hone in on the communication strategy to make sure a project like a, this one for decommissioning is successful. And then last but not least, uh, I will say, is this, make it fun. Okay, so I took pictures from actual Amex colleagues uh, that you can see they were having fun with actual pretending to unplug. We have an amazing video that the global team made. Uh, we have an artistic um, colleague who basically rendered one of their efforts in, in a way to say, hey, this is how we showed up. This is how what we accomplished and this is how we uh, derived what we needed to do. And then that's a cake. It does not look like a cake. I think there were a lot of... Uh, guesses on what that was. So I just said, okay, we're just going to put the symbol cake. It is a cake. <laughs> uh, but it was a cake, uh, and we had a lot of cake all throughout the globe to celebrate the fact that we accomplished something that nobody thought would be possible, uh, and nobody thought that we would do it in the timeline uh, across the board. So some just fun ways that, you know, colleagues um, represented it and really showed up and, and decommissioning really became a cool project uh, at Amex. And so thank you so much uh, for joining me on this journey uh, of the life cycle of a product. It starts everything from introduction to decommissioning. You will have challenges, you will have opportunities, but as we think about how technology moves and how we want to embrace it, we definitely want to make sure that we're innovating, we're embracing, but at the same time we're giving respect to what had existed in timely decommissioning across the board. So thank you for that. Uh, with that, I'm gonna turn it back to Megan.